Hi everyone, welcome back to the Trailline Podcast brought to you by Interactive Brokers. I'm your host, Richard Moglin, and joining us today is a very special guest, Dr. Norman Zeta. Uh, Dr. Zeta is a former hedge fund manager, entrepreneur, author, and is also the driving force behind the U.S. Investing Championship. Uh, Dr. Zeta, thank you so much for joining me and welcome. My pleasure. Awesome. It's great to have you on. And uh, uh, I'd love to just start things off by hearing a little bit about your background. Uh, like we said before we actually start recording, uh, you've done quite a few things in your career. So I'd love to hear about your experience as a professor, uh, teaching trading for, for a short while, as well as uh, being a hedge fund manager. Well, that's a, I'm going to stick to mostly the trading, if you don't mind, because uh, so let's see, I, I first I've always been interested, you know, because of my mathematical background, obviously, I've always been interested in making money. And, uh, you know, how do you do that? And uh, the markets are essentially a mathematical problem. Um, you know, you have prices going up and down and, you know, you have to figure out, well, you know, is it going to go up or is it going to go down? So there's definitely mathematics involved. Um, <clears throat> I had uh, been re reasonably unsuccessful, I would say. Uh, I think I started trading probably, uh, I'm, I'm thinking somewhere in my early 20s. And every once in a while, I would have moments of brilliance, but I would say mostly I would end up losing. And that was to some extent because I was trading options. Mm -hmm. I remember asking my father, and if I'm getting too far afield, please stop me, okay? But uh, I asked my father, who is a fairly famous professor of computer science, his name was Lotfi Zadeh, created something called Fuzzy Logic. But I remember asking him years ago, I think it was around 1974, to give you an idea how old I am, what would be a good stock to invest? And he said, Intel. Uh, so armed with that information, I proceeded to buy some Intel options and basically lost all my money. If I had simply bought the stock, right, I would have done great. Okay. So, so anyway, you know, I was watching TV and, um, you know, uh, at that time it was uh, financial news network, which later became CNBC. Okay. And you would have a broker or someone else on the program and they would be talking about how much money they were making, you know, and how they had just bought gold the day before. And of course, the, the next day when they're talking, gold is up, right? So they're always, they, they just seem to be complete geniuses, right? So I was convinced that, you know, everybody's making money, okay? And that's actually what you, that's the opinion you get when you, when you read the Wall Street Journal or Barron's, you kind of get the feeling that there are all these people making money. Right. They don't really report on all the people losing money. OK, so so I said, you know, let's see, there's there's 60,000 brokers and they're all making money. I'm going to start a competition to show them, you know, to to give them an opportunity to show how well they're doing and raise all this money. Right. So I figure I'll charge them 100 bucks a piece, 100 times 60,000 is like six million a year. I'm going to be rich. OK. Well, I put a lot of money into starting the, uh, the first trading competition, which was actually the U.S. Trading Championship. And I ended up with uh, 74 people paying $75 a piece. <laughs> so it wasn't exactly a massive success. I was losing money, but I kept at it. Am I, am I being too far afield here or is this okay? No, this is perfect. This is perfect. You're okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so I kept at it. Okay. And we started getting press coverage from entities like USA Today and so forth. And we actually on the front page, okay, of USA Today more than once. The problem was the coverage was more like milkman <laughs> uses knowledge to defeat, you know, Wall Street experts or gas station cashier shows secret, you know, whatever. So they were kind of mocking the thing. We were getting a lot of coverage, but it was sort of a joke in the eyes of the financial community. In any event, and I'm trying to I'm trying to shorten the whole narrative here. Uh, I realized at some point that I had to make the contest more um, meaningful by having a million dollar uh, account uh, requirement for a certain division. It was called Money Manager Verified Rating. When I started to do that, all of a sudden, um, I got 
covered on a quarterly basis by Barron's because now people were taking the contest very seriously and people were calling me and saying, you know, who should we invest with and so forth and so on. So I became a broker so I could profit from, you know, essentially recommending them to people and whatnot. And what then happened was that not infrequently, the person that I recommended the investors to either lost their money or didn't pay me. And I had learned some things by actually looking at some of my, my traders' accounts and trying to figure out what they were doing. And I actually was doing well trading myself. So I started trading myself. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I was basically a mutual fund timer. And uh, to make a long story short, you know, I, uh, I basically managed money successfully from uh, it was about 1991 to, you know, 2000, 2001 doing timing, uh, made about $160 million doing that, paid about $80 million in taxes, lost about $51 million on my magazine, which we're not going to be talking about, made a few other mistakes. So I don't have nearly what the money that I had, but I'm not completely broke. Okay. So I still have enough money for a microphone and a TV and a tele and a computer to talk to you. Uh, so um, let's see what happened next. Oh, and then I went back, actually, I, 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 I stupidly gave back all the money to my clients. Then I was attending the Andres Drobne uh, Money Mar- uh, uh, Manager Conferences. He's not doing it anymore, but I would urge your listeners to attend Money Manager Conferences. I know the Sone, Sone people are still doing it. They're all over the country. It's a good way to meet the right people and to just learn, Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in any event, so I went and, and Peter Thiel was giving a talk and people might know Peter Thiel because he was kind of, you know, he's a pretty well-known guy. Um, and he was recommending oil. And I, he convinced me, you know, peak oil and all that stuff. So I made a bunch of money trading oil, buying alongside, decided, you know, now I knew what I was doing again. And so I opened my fund up again. It's much smaller this time. Made money for a while, but then started losing, and I basically shut it down in 2012. So I am basically not a good stock trader. Uh, in fact, I would say I'm probably uh, a very good contrary indicator. You know, if I'm buying, you should be selling. I think that would be true in my case. And I think it's true in a lot of people's cases, actually. But I did do very well timing mutual funds. Unfortunately, the trick that we were using in those days is not available anymore. So... I could keep going, but I'd like to hear some questions if, if you have yeah, any. Of course, I, I've got plenty. And um, yeah, first things okay, first, I'd love to, yeah, I've got plenty. And I'd love to hear, uh, I heard a story, I, I was doing some research on, on the internet for in preparation for this interview that you ended up teaching um, a, a class on, on trading and, and, and traded a live account uh, right in front of the class um, and, and had a really strong performance during that quarter. And it was kind of a uh, it was kind of interesting interesting because at the time it was all about the efficient market hypothesis, um, and you kind of disproved that live in front of the class. So if you've got a story around um, yeah, know that that semester, I'd love to hear it. Okay, great. Okay, so all of this, by the way, if anyone's interested in my life story, I did publish a book called The Rise and Fall of Perfect Ten, mm-hmm. which is available on Amazon. It has not sold well. It's actually a great book. Uh, it not only talks about, you know, my, it talks about my gambling stories, which are great. It talks about, you know, behind the scenes doing an a, adult all natural magazine, great stories there. It talks about when I was a professor, a lot of really good stories. I mean, I would recommend, it. obviously I wrote it, but it's, it's, it's a fantastic book. Uh, so that story is in the book. And I'll be happy to talk about it. So mm-hmm. in 19, 19- uh, 82, 83, I was teaching at UCLA in the Graduate School of Management. I was there essentially as a substitute teacher, if you will. I was there to fill in for a faculty member who was, they call it on, going on sabbatical in any event. Um, I had um, wanted to befriend myself to the finance faculty. And um, I was in the elevator with a fellow named Richard Roll. I don't know what he's doing now, but at one time he was a pretty big money manager. So I imagine he's probably still around anyway. And he was a big proponent of efficient market. 
And so I started speaking to Professor Roll in the elevator and he pretended I wasn't there. It was sort of like, you know, in high school, like I'm like part of the not in group and he's in the in group and he's not going to speak to me. And it was kind of insulting because from from a, you know, a a a a. a educational standpoint, math is a pecking order above business. So because of my math background, I was actually, in my mind, the more, you know, qualified entity in any of that. So I didn't like that. So in my last quarter, I had an opportunity, I was supposed to teach some PhD course on a, a subject that I can't even understand <laughs> what it meant, you know, D share convex functions on whatever, which no one would have attended. So I said, you know what, let me see if I can teach a course on how to make money in the stock and commodities markets. So I went to my departmental chairman who was not in the finance, he was separate. He was in the math area of business. And I said, uh, you know, can I teach this course? And he said, sure, you'll probably get, you know, a good, a good crowd of students. So word spread that I was going to teach this practical course on how to make money in the stock and commodities markets. And because I had already showed my students, because I had taught a course in statistics before where I showed them the Black-Scholes model and how to derive it and all this kind of fun stuff, mm -hmm. um, I had like 150 or 200 people show up. I got Richard Roll's auditorium. <laughs> he probably got my cubbyhole classroom, whatever. So he was not happy. And then the word spread. And then so then... So you have to remember, they, they all are efficient market guys in the finance faculty at this point. And that basically means you basically can't make money in the markets. That's the efficient market there, basically. So, you know, I start off and I say, and I, I, I had these two weird uh, books. I had Harry Brown's How You Can Profit from Monetary Crisis, which no one remembers anymore. And I had Marty Zweig's Blue Book, which probably nobody remembers anymore. But those were the textbooks, not typical, because I'm not a typical guy. And the other thing I told the class was, OK, everyone's going to do a project, you know, like, for example, if the stock market goes up three days in a row, you know, like more than a few percent, you know, what's going to happen on the next day? What's the distribution? You know, and somebody raised their hand and said, wait a minute, you know, we've we've been taught that you can't make money in the market. So why are we bothering to doing this? You can't make money in the market. So I said, well, I don't completely agree with that. I said, and to prove it to you, I'm going to open a real ten thousand dollar account. And I'm going to trade it in front of the class. You're going to know exactly what I'm doing, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to use your research to help me, okay? This has not been done before to the best of my knowledge. Now, I did have a couple of systems that I mentioned to the class that I kind of created for my, you know, kind of thought of, uh, so which I mentioned to them. I said, first of all, one system is if a commodity goes up, you know, like maybe three times it's, 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 you know, price over the last say, over the last say five years, look for an opportunity to sell the commodity short. Because what will typically happen is because the price has gone up so much, you will have less demand and more production, mm -hmm. right? Now that would have worked very well in the oil market, by the way, you know, it went to hundred, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it went to 140 something and came crashing down, right? So. So that was one system, okay? Of course, it's tricky to figure out when to short it, but you're on the right side if you do short it, okay? And if you can hold it, you're gonna make money in the end. Um, the, another system was, oh, another system was don't go against the Fed, which is basically, if the Fed chairman tells you to buy bonds, buy bonds. And the, the best example was Volcker said, buy bonds years ago when the interest rates were 12%, you would have made a lot of money, you know? And because he can control basically what the interest rates are, he's not going to be wrong, okay? That was another system, which I believe would work out well even today. And the last system was, uh, if a war breaks out and look to see if it's an irrelevant war, short gold and silver, basically the day, first day of the fight. Lo and behold, so I put 10,000 in the account. Lo and behold, like a few days later, the Falklands War breaks out, the most insignificant war of all time. You know, Falcons was an island off the coast of Argentina. I guess it was it was controlled by Britain. The Argentinians wanted it back. It, it was just a nothing event. Gold and silver go up. Gold goes up $40. I short two contracts. It goes down $40. I make $8,000 on a $10,000 account in <laughs> one or two days. The finance faculty just goes berserk. Like, who is this guy? What is he doing? Rollers in China, he's calling 
the dean of my department saying, what is this guy doing? He doesn't even have a business degree. Fire him, right? <laughs> anyway, I ended up making 140% in the account. And that's one of the reasons, by the way, I recommend the contest, because I believe that all eyes were upon me. Mm-hmm. And when all eyes were upon me, I traded a lot better than I would trade when all eyes are not upon me because I proceeded to lose the 140% back later, right? So, so that's one of the reasons I recommend the contest, not only because it's going to help them potentially become a billionaire, but because it will help their trading. Mm-hmm. Perfect. And over the course of, of many years doing the contest and organizing it, um, I'm sure you've gotten to meet some amazing characters. You've had traders like Paul Tudor Jones, uh, David Ryan, uh, Mark Minervini, both back in the 90s, as well as obviously last year. So I'd love to hear any stories you have about these pro- prolific traders um, during, you know, when they went out and won the championship. Well, the best story about Paul Tudor Jones was, I didn't really even know who he was, but I was like a maniac about making sure that no one was cheating. So Paul Tudor Jones at that time was trading futures. I actually asked him to phone in his trades to me. (laughs) And that was pretty much, that was the straw that broke the camel back. He only entered one competition, did well in it. uh, And that was the end that I saw Paul Tudor Jones. Of course, he didn't need the contest after that. Um, I think Mark Strom is one of the more interesting stories because Mark Strom, um, he was, he was managing money for Kane Anderson when I first met him. And actually, the Anderson of Kane Anderson is the same Anderson in Anderson Graduate School of Management. He's an attorney who actually built, you know, he contributed to UCLA and they built the graduate school after his mm-hmm. and used his name there. So, but Mark really did well from the contest because this is a money manager verified rating because he was on the cover of Barron's a number of times. And um, the only thing I can say about him is when his wife divorced him recently, I think she got something on the order of $100 million. So it gives you an idea of how much money Mark made. And I think, you know, that was a fraction of his net worth. Uh, Let's see, who else? I never never met David Ryan, but I will Mm -hmm. say that um, his two sons have entered the current competition. And he seems to be one of the real deal kind of people, you know, in other words, some of these managers are kind of flash in the pans, but I do believe that, you know, the whole can slim thing that I think was basically created by William O'Neill, if I'm wrong on this, forgive me, but you know, which David Ryan, I believe is a proponent of, I do believe there's some real merit to that. Um, I've never asked Mark Minovini specifically if he uses that. You know, I know Mark Minovini is a very strong trader also. They're but they're friends, you know, uh, Minovini and, and Ryan do things together. But I do think Ryan, you know, he, he did well a number of years. Um, and I think he's the kind of guy that people need to kind of, you know, pay attention to. Um, Marty Schwartz, I worked for Marty Schwartz for a small time. Um uh, you know, I don't mind saying this, but when we raised money for him, I think he made 4% for his clients. So after doing really well, you know, in my contest, he did nothing for his clients. So that's my comment on Marty Schwartz. Uh, Frankie Joe, I used to talk to a sweet guy, you know, he committed suicide. That was kind of a real shock. Um, stories. I can get mad at people, you know, I have, you know, when people try to cheat or when I think they're trying to cheat, um, you know, I can, I can sound like someone who would, you would not think ever taught in any university. And I remember one guy after I sweared at him for a while, he said, were you really a professor? So uh, that's not really a story on any one person, but um, let's see. You know, they're just, I mean, some people that are real deal, other people just get lucky, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, actually, going back to your background, I, I did want to ask this because I'm curious. Um, I myself, I've got kind of a STEM background. I, I graduated with a degree in engineering. And uh, since obviously you've got a background in mathematics, I wondered if you have any thoughts on how well that translates over to um, obviously gambling, but also trading stocks or commodities or, or the markets as well. Okay. So I tell people, um, that the two best fields are computer science and money management. 
computer science, obviously, because look at all of the people that have made just gajillion dollars in computer science. Money management is a really good field because you can make a lot of money in money management also. As far as the connection between computer science and money management, it is very, very strong. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, someone like Jim, Jim Simons, right, he basically, you know, I think he was a mathematician, but he basically... His, 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 his analysis was computer-based, computer, computer based, right? Yeah. Anybody who really wants to do well in money management probably at some point will have to either write computer programs themselves or hire someone to do it because, you know, there's a lot of information going around and you really need a computer to really be, you know, at the top of the, of the, of, of the game. Yeah, makes sense. And I've actually got his book behind me on the shelf. Uh, uh, I forget what it's called. Um, the Man Who Beat the Market or something similar to that. I think it's- Right, well, that was written by somebody yeah. else about yes. Jim Simons, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And um, I, I've also talked with, got the chance to talk with Jack Swagger, who's written Market Wizards. Right. And I thought you might right. have an interesting perspective on this as well, uh, considering you've, you've been around a lot of great traders. I was wondering if you've noticed any similar traits in the top performers, whether it's- uh, you know, their personality, their their routines, any of that. Obviously, you might not have gotten a chance to get to know all of these traders, but of the ones that you did get a chance to talk to, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I'm going to make a different statement. I mean, I'm going to answer kind of a different question, if you don't mind. I really believe that um, one of the secrets to market success uh, is to basically never sell on a never sell on a panic situation i mean i think that you know that's you know been proven over and over if the world comes to an end it comes to an end right so um i never really you know even though i actually worked for marty schwartz for a while i sat in his office while he was trading he wasn't doing anything that i could i could not i i, I did that to learn from him i learned nothing okay mm -hmm. um I would love to know what Jim Simons is actually doing. I've talked to friends, but we couldn't completely figure it out. Uh, I think the big problem, so I'm really not answering your question, but I'm sorry. I think it's, a, it's an important answer. Yeah. I think that realistically, when you're managing billions of dollars, uh, it's very, very different. Okay. You know, it's one thing to make like 100, 200% on a 10 or even a hundred thousand dollar count. You're not going to make 100% on a $20 billion account. So the whole the whole game changes. You have to take much longer view positions. And so it becomes it becomes not just a question of, of, of computer science. It becomes a question of, of forecasting, you know, what's going to happen down the road. Mm -hmm. And as I tell people sometimes, there's a very big difference between sports betting and, and playing the market. Uh, in sports betting, all you have to do is determine the better team, okay? When you're playing the market, determining the better team is not really what you need to do. You need to determine how the public perception of each stock is going to change. And that's, that's, a, different, that's a different game. Uh, getting back to the issue of the traders, I don't really, I cannot, most traders don't really tell you <laughs> Process, exactly yes. what their secrets are right so i can't really answer your question uh but i'm sure one thing is they they cut losses short i'm sure that that's probably true yeah makes sense and um it, it seems like in recent times uh the inter the traders i was able to interview over the recent years who've competed they do kind of base it, they might not be completely canceling based but their foundation is a little bit with william o'neill canceling that type of trading so um, it's interesting to me that a lot of the top performers kind of share that commonality between them, that uh, they, they've been inspired by many of the same traders, um, William O'Neill, um, Jesse Livermore, Nicholas Starvis, th those type of figures in history. Yeah, I believe that's correct. I should have added that. I sort of said that before, though, Yeah. that I think David Ryan is the real deal. Yeah. Mark Benavini yeah. is the real deal. Absolutely. And um, I'd love to hear why, um, and you kind of answered it before, but I'd love to hear just uh, a little bit more uh, depth about it, uh, why you have those two different divisions. Uh, you've got the uh, the money, money manager division over $1 million account, and then I believe the, the other division, is it $20,000 minimum? Is, is that correct? Yeah. Um, 
I really wish I had more people in the in the million dollar plus. Hopefully that'll happen. But but mm -hmm. the, the reason is that, you know, the, the million dollar plus, those returns are much more meaningful in the sense that, you know, if you're trading over a billion dollars, A, you've got more money that you have to invest. So it's closer to like real life if you're trying to manage like more money. Secondly, you're not going to go crazy and 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 put on the kind of risks and trades that you might do if you were trading 20,000. Yeah. So Mark Minamini really did something phenomenal when he was, I think it was 334.8 or 338.4, whatever it was. That was really a record shattering performance on a million plus account. Yeah. So, so talk to me a little bit about the rules of the contest, uh, how people can join and also the overall audit process. Cause I, I think that that may be something that people are curious about watching this. Okay. So we have a website, it's called financial dash competitions.com. We publish the standings there. If you go to the website, there's a link on the left for joining. You can still join the competition, by the way. If you join late, we track you from the point, the time that you join onward. So, um, so for example, if someone were to join, you know, February 28th, hypothetically, you know, we would track your performance. You would give us an account number, a pay an entry fee, which is 425 for the, for the year, for the investing and a thousand for the million plus division. And then every month, if you were doing well, you would send in your brokerage statements to us, say, you know, I want my name to appear as thus and such, I'm up thus and such, send me the brokerage statements, tell me how much you think you're up, and then I will verify that you're up that much. And the nice thing about interactive brokers, which I actually recommend to people, is they have made the process of determining a time-weighted average real easy. They just mm -hmm. compute it. And it's right there. So anybody who enters, and a lot of our people are actually interactive brokers clients, okay? Anybody who has an interactive brokers account, you know, the the the, the verification is real easy. Interactive brokers just says the guy is up this thus and such. And they they take into account any monies that were added, any monies that were removed. That makes things very easy. Some of the other brokers just don't do that. And so it's a little more complicated to determine their, the exact percentage increase. And in some cases, the, com the contestant is actually penalized for not using interactive brokers because I don't do, I am not willing to do the time weighted average for them. Yeah. I will approximate it, but usually that approximation is an underestimate of their performance. I'm not sure I answered your question. No, that makes sense. And do they have to report every single month? How does that work to make sure, you know, they're not using multiple accounts and, and just coming back at the end of the year if they had a good return in one account? Okay, so so they only re uh, uh, report when they want. You're buying a call option. Mm -hmm. You're basically, for the $425, you're buying a call option, which gives you the right to report if you're positive and choose to do so. So you could pay the 425 and just say, you know what, Norm Zeta is a scumbag. I don't want to report. I'm trying to be funny here, but you're not laughing, but uh, I'm laughing. Okay. So, so, uh, so, so, so the four, so, so it's a call option. So you, you prepare whatever you want. Okay. Uh, you can't use two accounts. In other words, you, when you enter the contest, you say, I'm using account one, two, three, four, five. You're locked into one, two, three, four, five. You can't send me the statement for account two, three, four, five, six. I'll say that's not the account you entered. Okay, so this is a this is a way of actually determining how people are doing. The problem with what goes on in Wall Street right now is that most of the time, you know, some guy has like ten different funds. He calls the newspaper up or and sends out a press release. Look at my, you know, he picks his best fund. He says, look what I did, right? Well, actually, his average performance was a lot lower. So the only way to really uh, deal with that is to do it the way I'm doing it, which is you actually specify one account number that is going to determine your performance, and that's it. So Absolutely. And um, that's pretty much most of the questions I have. But, uh, Norm, I'd love to just kind of ask you if there's any kind of other things we should know about the contest, uh, your trading past, or just general advice you have for traders watching this uh, who want to learn more and, and, and potentially want to compete in your contest in the future. Uh, like I said before, I think that the best two fields 
are computer science and money management. Mm -hmm. So anyone who is interested in money management right now, I say, do not give up, you know, keep, keep reading, keep listening, keep learning. I would suggest that you go to money manager conferences. They may cost you a thousand dollars to get in, but it might very well be worth it. You'll meet money managers. You'll learn people will be giving talks. And usually those guys are pretty smart and, you know, maybe work, you know, as a result of that, you might be able to work with a hedge fund company, which is a wonderful way to make a lot of money and, you know, learn the business. Perfect. Uh, well, Dr. Zaya, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, all the links that you mentioned will be down below in the description for everybody watching. And uh, to everybody out there, thanks so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed, please go ahead and leave a like down below and subscribe if you're new to the channel. And we'll see you guys in future videos. Thanks. Thank you.